elle de votre choix. Ready, Governor? I'm ready. So, go ahead. <coughs> Greg Quinn. Greg Quinn, Bloomberg News. Uh, Governor, looking ahead to next year, uh, we still have uncertainty in the global economy. What do you see as the biggest um, economic or geo geopolitical risk in the world economy next year? Well, choosing the biggest is always a hard uh, thing when there's so much going on. Um, but I suppose the, uh, the most troubling thing at this stage would be the, the potential uh, that we have in the situation between uh, Russia, Ukraine, Europe at a time when Europe is already uh, in a very slow or close to zero growth uh, situation. Um, and uh, the good news on that front, of course, is that we, we received the AQR, the Asset Quality Reviews uh, uh, data from, uh, from Europe, which was quite reassuring that uh, banks are, are uh, capitalizing themselves well and so on. So that's, that's a good uh, sort of uh, piece of news there that the uh, system can withstand uh, uh, those kinds of shocks. Um, but the fact is, from our point of view as an economic story, Europe is a very big piece of the world economy and it's uh, obviously laboring uh, under some very serious headwinds. So uh, we would really like to see that continue to progress in a positive manner, but it's a, it's a risk uh, for our outlook as well as theirs. Um, looking at um, the GDP revisions that happened in Canada uh, a little while ago, you, you mentioned that they just took a little bit of slack off. There are some economists who have, who have said over a longer period that there might not be much slack in the Canadian economy to begin with. Um, are, are you worried that we might be in a situation where we're closer to that kind of um, closing of the output gap than you're anticipating? Uh, no. Um, as I was mentioning about the, uh, the revisions which were to history raised the, the level of GDP. Um, and so uh, we, we, frankly, as economists, we never really know to what extent that new level of GDP is supply versus demand, hence, hence the business about the gap. So in effect, we have a fairly mechanical approach to that. It's an informed mechanical modeling approach, which attempts to decompose based on how the economy is behaving. So there is a degree of, uh, of judgment that still needs to be applied to those. But uh, when we did it, we would suggest, well, we, sh we need to make sure people understand that our, the measure of the output gap, which we present, will be a slightly smaller number uh, than before based on that outcome. Uh, but measuring the capacity of the economy is a different matter. So the, the excess capacity that the economy is carrying uh, is ultimately a, a labor force matter um, because, as we described in the monetary policy report uh, back in October uh, in that special box, we've got r many reasons to point to uh, destruction during the down part of the cycle. That destruction removes supply from the system. It means that for a level of demand, you've reduced the output gap because supply has been shrinking. The next phase of the upturn which we believe is just beginning, is one where supply is actually rising because companies are investing in new capacity and new companies are being created and creating new jobs. And so the ultimate source of that capacity is actually the labor market, which as we know has quite a bit of excess capacity. <coughs> Jonathan Spicer with Reuters. Uh, Governor, I wanted to return the conversation to oil. Uh, the last I saw, um, uh, Texas crude is a couple of pennies away from $60. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and oil and monetary policy, if we could, you said in the past that um, the policy stance is neutral. I'm wondering um, what it would take to push that uh, to uh, a situation where the Bank of Canada was more likely to ease than to tighten mm -hmm. uh, in the future. Well, as I've uh, discussed in the past and uh, tried to uh, present faithfully in that paper I wrote, uh, we published it in the fall, on, uh, on, on uh, capturing uncertainty in the policy discussion, uh, this is a risk management question that you're really posing. So uh, what we will do, let's say, in time for our next monetary policy report in January is to assess how all these things are affecting our projected profile for inflation. That is, of course, our anchor in this exercise. 
And so if the risks uh, that uh, are, uh, are on that compared to our previous analysis are such that the profile for inflation is being pushed down relative to our target, that, that's when we'd be talking about there would be perhaps downside risks to our inflation uh, profile. If it were the other way around, then we'd be saying, well, based on where we were last time, there are now upside risks to the inflation profile. So that would be the main way that we would talk about fundamentals and how those fundamental risks are affecting our outlook for inflation. And uh, from there, uh, we would be still watching the data unfold to see if our expectations were being confirmed or rejected by the new data, just as all market participants would do is the same. Michael Derby. Um, yeah, Mike Derby from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, New York Fed President Bill Dudley has said that expectations that U.S. interest rates might rise in mid-2015 are, are reasonable to him. Um, are you, do you have any thoughts about what an increase in U.S. monetary policy uh, short-term rates could mean for Canada? Are there any implications that you see from an action like that? And is Bank of Canada planning for any you know, major shift in the U.S. interest rate structure? Well, all central banks are, uh, are taking uh, that on board. That is, of course, uh, um, a major uh, topic of discussion among central banks uh, because it's been extremely well articulated by the Fed. We know exactly uh, uh, what issues they're looking at and so on. So um, uh, no one should be unprepared, let's say, for, for this. For us, our framework is based on our inflation targets, our inflation objective. And so what we will need to do is as that process unfolds, uh, undoubtedly it will be because the U.S. economy is gathering even more momentum, which uh, unambiguously is positive for Canada, uh, with, as I was saying in the, in the room there, uh, not, not one for one, but you know, obviously a positive. And so all those impacts have to be taken on board. And just as I was just describing a moment ago, we have to then assess what it means for our projected profile for inflation to decide what it might mean for, for us. But what that, to underscore what that means is that our process is an independent one. It's not about what, what our interest rate's doing. Um, but uh, one of the uh, mechanisms that will be at play uh, will be that um, it's, it's less about what the, uh, the Fed funds rate is doing or what the short-term interest rates are doing. It's a question more about how bond markets, global bond markets, are reacting uh, to that situation. So you can see that over the last few months, despite all that, the end of uh, QE, the tapering program ended and so on, global bond yields actually continued to drift down. Um, and so that, of course, feeds directly into our bond market, and it feeds directly into th th things as mortgage rates, uh, things that the prices that people actually pay for, for borrowing. So uh, the question, therefore, is a very complicated one on how it has its ultimate effect on the Canadian economy and on our inflation profile. But we will, of course, you know, redo our work as, as each of those things uh, comes into play. So the bottom line, there's nothing automatic about it. There's not, no mechanics there. David Scanlon. Hi, uh, Dave Scanlon with, uh, with Bloomberg. <coughs> I wanted to follow up on your, uh, your comments and also the, the report uh, yesterday on the housing market. <coughs> on the one hand, you're saying that the market may be overvalued by 10 to 30 percent, and you're also saying you anticipate a soft landing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether you are concerned, though, that that may not be uh, across the board, that we may see sectors, cities, geographies that are harder hit than others. And I'm thinking of uh, the, the condo market perhaps in Toronto mm -hmm. or certainly the Alberta market given the free fall that we're seeing in oil and as a result other uh, measures that might be needed to, to uh, avoid that. Yes, well as always, uh, Canada is a very diverse economy and uh, so any macro measure has that kind of dimension to it. Um, but that doesn't mean you have an, uh, the sort of the deep uh, insight that you'd like uh, in order to make those kinds of predictions. So I won't make any. Uh, there's no question that the, uh, the, the vigor of the housing market has been a fairly, um, a fairly concentrated thing um, in just a small number of uh, cities, but they're, not, they're really big cities, so they, they're, they matter to the macro, uh, to the macro market. Um, you can certainly find lots of cities where there's already what you would you'd have to call a soft landing, that there's really no 
no sense of heat or anything like that, and everything seems to be under control. People want to buy a house, they buy a house, and it's like that. Uh, so um, uh, looking beneath, uh, we don't think of it as one of the things that we are trying to influence or to do anything about, but we use that as insight into uh, what may be going on. And you can't dismiss something just because it's in Toronto, because it's such a big uh, part of the thing and it will affect people's expectations. So uh, you mentioned things that you would, as an economist, you'd be on the lookout for, you know, will lower oil prices have a more local effect? Yes. Uh, not just uh, Calgary, but possibly uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, um, you know, Saskatchewan. So there, there's, and, and the, the resource prices in general are down. So it affects a lot more areas of the country uh, than just the oil. And so uh, that's a, a more general uh, shock, as we were describing in one of the earlier questions, that's going to affect um, how the economy behaves, how much, how much of an output gap we have, or how it's likely to evolve through through time. And those things have to be taken on board in understanding um, uh, how important that question of overvaluation is. Um, you know, by our by our modeling, we think that the economy will continue to gather momentum and that will continue to generate new jobs and incomes, and that, of course, buttresses the, the housing market. So is somebody buying a house because now they've got a nice, stable job? Or are they buying a house because interest rates are really low and they, they're buying a second one or whatever goes on in a hot housing market? So it'll be hard for us to tell the differences between those things. So for us, mainly it's about fundamentals. The fundamentals are strengthening. That's a good thing. And unambiguously, that's going to make us less concerned about that vulnerability. It's important that that, understand that, that housing thing is a vulnerability. Uh, and in our report, we distinguish between vulnerability and risk. The risk comes when some catalyst sets off the vulnerability. In this case, it would be, let's say, a rise in unemployment, a significant one, where it makes people ha to have difficulty paying for their mortgage, or a rapid rise in mortgage rates. Uh, neither of which we're expecting. So that's uh, that's why we we're saying it's a, it's a low probability right. uh, event. Uh, just a, a follow-up, mm -hmm. if, if I may. I was um, intrigued by your answer um, in response to the question about the uh, sort of Canada's beta to, to the U.S. recovery and how it's different this time because yeah. there are so many manufacturers who in the past would have benefited, benefited from the U.S. Uh, uplift that are you know, no longer in business. So yeah. what, what is the... Um, What's the answer there, and, uh, and are there sectors, perhaps export sectors, that uh, are still in business that just haven't yet felt the yeah. uplift from the U.S. economy that might provide a bit of yes. optimism? Yes. It's very important there that you, you think of it as a subsector question, which is what you've done. Um, and so you know, and, and what I make it clear is that beta hasn't gone suddenly to zero. It's, it's just a little less, it seems, than what we saw in the past. And, and so I try to explain how much of it we've been able to un understand uh, in the way you described. So, uh, but what we, uh, <clears throat> what we did do is we, we, we separated the, the 31 broad sectors in the export sector into, um, into the, the likely winners, the ones likely to still have a high beta, and those that seem not to. And so out of the, uh, the ones that we expect to lead uh, the export recovery, they actually are. And, and they're primarily connected, uh, the general statement, they're connected to lots of things, but they're, most of them are connected to the U.S. export side. So if you have, if you have say, 3% growth in U.S. GDP, it matters whether it's government spending or consumption spending or investment spending that's, that's doing it. Um, because Canada has stronger uh, export connection, and the strongest export connection between Canada and the U.S. is in the investment stream. And it's both ways. Okay, it's because it's machinery and equipment, things that that because components crossing the border, uh, and 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 it's things such as the aerospace business, where it's the, the business, the supply network straddles the border, regardless of whether it's Bombardier or Boeing that's is building the airplane. There are Canadian and American producers of the parts. So as those kinds of spending go up, uh, we get a much bigger beta on the on the export side. And we're beginning to see that packaging materials, uh, certain um, things connected to the housing business, such as wood products, you know, a little bit, uh, not, 
the uh, sort of like the, the uh, high value wood products like flooring and doors, windows, those kinds of things that go into the housing business. Um, and so, um, so that gives you the idea. So the, the point is that that is that is moving, and it's exactly where we expected. And there are a few others that you know were kind of unexpected, like pharmaceuticals, really strong export growth. And, and this kind of thing. So those are kind of new and emerging and, and uh, cool stories. So we're not uh, pessimistic on this. We're just trying to be realistic. So well, let's, uh, we have a gap between how many exports we thought we'd have by now and how many we have actually have. And we're not going to assume that that gap's going to zero anytime soon. We're actually basing a conser our outlook on a conservative assumption that that gap is pretty well going to sit there and they're going to kind of go up together based on these ones that are well connected. And if we get some of that market share back through time, it'll probably be because of new companies or the companies that, uh, that, that went through this and became more efficient now are connected to that, uh, that U.S. recovery and they're going to really get new transactions. And of course, all of that enhanced by the depreciation of the Canadian dollar, which has happened which really helps them position that, uh, that offer to the international market. Looks like we have time for a quick second round. We have time for about one or two more questions. So okay. Uh, I'd like to ask about securitization, but a quick follow-up on, on the January monetary policy review. Um, <coughs> it, 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 it occurs to me that um, uh, you've mentioned forward guidance may be necessary in certain circumstances going forward. Uh, might the oil situation, I mean, would you be prepared to, to return to a forward guidance communications stance given the oil situation? Well, we want to make it clear that uh, we, we don't dislike forward guidance at all. We think it's an important tool to have at our fingertips uh, for when we need it. Uh, we believe it's, um, it's, it's got a, a big utility at times when you're at the zero lower bound. So there's an asymmetry uh, in the market. The markets aren't really trading two-way. You know, so the forward guidance, all it does is enhance it, if you like. But once we're away from that, the two-way trading has a lot of benefits, and uh, by not giving forward guidance, you enhance that. And so uh, it means that when you do bring forward guidance back, it'll be for a good reason, and hopefully it'll have a significant impact. So that uh, rather than getting addicted to it and it always being there, uh, which is, I think, where we were before. So uh, I won't speculate on when that will make sense. It would, I think it would make most sense um, at a time when there's market uh, turbulence or uh, stress where extra clarity from the central bank will, will play a useful role. Um, but I think that uh, in general, if we're open and transparent about our, our analysis of the fundamentals and the risks to that outlook uh, so that people all understand them as well as we do, then we will have done our thorough job because actually the market serves us well to grind out the day-to-day reaction to news, that's a, that's a very positive thing uh, to have working for you. Um, and so I would rather preserve that than cut it all out by having, you know, explicit forward guidance under most circumstances. Last question. Okay. And, and your, your speech is, of course, about uh, securitization. Yes. I, I understand it was a two-handed speech. I, I appreciate that. But, but you were uh, encouraging more securitization at the, at the banks. And, 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 and I just wanted to ask, you know, uh, that does pose uh, risks, potentially un unnecessary risks for banks and others uh, because they have less skin in the game. So do you have any concerns uh, on that level? Well, fundamentally, uh, I mean, I'm a central banker. I'm paid to be concerned about just about everything. And, uh, and so I think the idea, though, is one of the things that concerns me a lot is that we not uh, handcuff financial intermediaries so much that we can't actually get the job done of fostering the kind of recovery that we all need. Um, just to put it this way, you know, we say, well, the U.S. economy looks like it's getting up some good momentum. That's great. Uh, let's just keep reminding ourselves that interest rates are zero. Okay, well, what would you expect? You would expect to see the economy growing pretty well at zero interest rates. And that just gives you a sense of what the headwinds are out there in the world. Uh, they, are, they are dissipating, but they have not gone away. So importantly then, what we need is that the process of natural growth requires a lot of financial intermediation. If you're an existing company with a good track record, you have no problem getting the credit you need to grow your business. Uh, but if you're a company that was downsized by 30, 40, 50 percent during the downturn, 
and you restructured all your debt and everything, well, you know, you may not have the kind of access to capital that you need to grow your business. And let's face it, if you're a brand new company, you know, and event, if you've grown out, the, out of the venture cap space and you need a banker, you may not get everything that you need to grow that business to the next new story. So all of those things matter a lot, and we've got to have that context in front of us. And so where does securitization go in that framework? Well, you know, I think it has to be an important uh, feature of the landscape. And uh, what, I, what we need is for it to, to develop in a way which does not pose significant risks to, you know, we're not talking about risks in general, but where do the risks land? And if those risks don't land in the core of our financial system, payments and contagion and all that, then we can say, well, that's, that's a very positive development. That means that companies can get what they need and to grow the economy without putting any things substantially in danger given the principles behind our financial supervision. So that's the ideal outcome. Uh, implementing that, it's a matter of time and judgment and, uh, and good regulatory practice, which is, of course, widely discussed across countries and so on. So it's, uh, it was meant to be speculative, if you like. It's, it is more about outlining what I think are important principles to take us forward. Thank you. Merci. Thanks, everybody.